the fact of God being here and available as presence, as being, as the witnessing. The blessing that is the grace is that. Even if we got a glimpse in the whole in our whole lifetime, if we just got a glimpse. of him, whether that glimpse was non-perceptual in the form of pure awareness, noticing the self is pure insight, is intuition, or that glimpse is in the form of the heart vibration <coughs> accompanied by Unconditional love, all that glimpses of boundless being, or even if the glimpses in the form of Ram, Krishna, Jesus, whatever they are devoted to. I think it's such a privilege How can we be concerned about camera <laughs> audio? No, we want to make sure it's good, but uh, it's not priority so I'm sorry but he's here Imagine if our lives were lived like this, all of our lives, they we lived in our heart, at His holy field. All this Maya can play out and you know, creates problems and it resolves them. I am at his holy feet. I may say I am at his holy feet. I may say I am that holy presence. I may say even the presence arises from within myself. But as long as these words are coming from intuitive insight, and they are about him. Doesn't matter what form the expression takes. We don't have to give it to our intellect and say, but is it like this or is it like that? It's too far away. And the computation is too far away when you're sitting in his life. Let the world compute this thing. Let them judge whether you're right or wrong. All our expectations from this surface level, ephemeral, firefly, we make our entire life about this. When we empty of that self concern, when we empty of that self will, then we can just be empty. And the beauty of this empty is that it leaves you full. Mm -hmm.
but if you try to become empty to be full, then it doesn't work. If you try to die so that you can live, then it doesn't work. If you let go so that you can attain or achieve, then it doesn't work. But when it is empty, can you say that uh, only perceptions are apparent to you? And it is empty, which means that you're not buying into any thoughts about anything at all, actually. But especially about the non existent me. Empty handed, full hearted. Empty handed and full hearted. What do you find? So whether you call it open and empty or pure perception or remaining in the unborn or to be in the no mind, contrary to the mind's idea of an empty room or a nihilistic nothingness. Contrary to all of these notions, you find that I am Empty of myself, I am. And that I am is God's presence. Or the Sadhguru presence, or the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Atma. And although all things are possible in God, I would say it's extremely rare to come to the presence and especially to live in the presence unless we are empty of ourselves. Empty of the limited one. We get a window into his glory, his grace, his vast reality. And usually, even dipping the toe in 
selfishness, self-concern or self-will, dipping a toe in that seems to blur our vision to a greater reality. And that includes all of our spiritual aspirations as well. So if you hold on to it and say, I want to meet God so that then something, then we are already in trouble. So that then I can be happy, so that then I can be a teacher, so that then my life is sorted. So we mean empty of all of this. And this waking state, empty of conceptual grasping, is just to remain in pure perception. And when we remain in pure perception, can anyone say that it is only perception which are apparent? <laughs> so although we call it pure perception, it's actually much more than that. The witness of all of this perception, whether you like it or not, whether you agree or not, whether the mind gives you certification or not, is apparent to you. Nobody ever feels like there is a world without a witnessing. Can anyone say that their experience is just a world full of perception, sensation, everything, and there is no witnessing. None of you will say that. The witnessing of the world, and you will also confirm that I am the witness. You may say, I don't know who that is, I can't figure it out, I can't stay in that, all that mind resistance and attack will come. But nobody is saying that somebody else is witnessing this realm of perception. It is apparent that it is you. Yeah. So, if that I cannot be perceived and really can't be thought about either and when you think about it, it's just nonsense. Then what is the way in which we have come to this recognition or realization. How is the unperceivable known? You could actually say it is known simply or naturally or organically, effortlessly. But since we want to sound a bit fancy, we say intuitively. It is known intuitively. And everything that is worth knowing is worth knowing only in this way. How is presence known intuitively? How is love known intuitively? How is timelessness known intuitively? How is birthlessness, birthlessness known intuitively? So to live intuitively is what I have been calling 
to live in the way of the heart. When you ask yourself, who am I? If you get an answer, then that answer must be looked at. And Bhagavan has told us that we must ask the question, who witnesses this thought? So any conceptual answer, we look at it and ask ourselves, who witnesses? Who witnesses even this? Don't settle till you come to this recognition, to this realization, which is purely intuitive. Purely intuitive means happens in the light of the Sadguru's presence. Because the Sadhguru is the, the Holy Spirit, the Atma, that is the holder of this intuition. It is the owner of this intuition of self-knowledge. So to remain in the presence in this way and to recognize that my reality is beyond even presence and even being whose presence we are privileged to taste. The reality of who I am is beyond all of these things. So this is insight and we have at least a thousand satsangs where we have spoken about insight and all the questions have been asked to bring you to insight. Now in this game called Maya, of course those who come to true intuitive insight are truly blessed. There is no question about that. It is really important, the most important, to come to God and the truth of who we are. There is nothing that can be more important than that. But I want to make a mo moderation to or a modulation to the famous uh, Zen saying before enlightenment, chopping wood, fetching water. After enlightenment, chopping wood, fetching water. And I would like to say that before enlightenment, love and servitude, and after enlightenment, love and servitude. And I'm going to attempt to speak about why this is important. All the words are not that easy to explain this. When you come to 
pure inside there is no me there is no individual me at least for a few moments then you will notice that just like bhagwan called it the burnt ashes of the rope the rope used to be the concept of our separate individuality now it is burnt because of the insight that we've had now this thing <laughs> bhagwan you forgive me if i'm taking the metaphor too far but but the thing is that this rope may be burnt but it is not dead and i have really noticed this for all my spiritual life that the rope may get burnt as a result of our awakening experiences but we can never call that burnt rope dead because if that remnants of that individuality starts to grasp on to the intuitive insight and make it conceptual and build an individuality again based on that so if it says i am that the only one the lord and master of this universe it is true but if the separate limited me gets attached to let's call it advaitic knowledge then it starts to take itself to be a glorified individuality like a glorified achiever uh one with god and uh, all kinds of silliness which we were i'm sure seen in spirituality including of course here i'm not saying that uh, this expression of satsang with ananta has been empty of foolishness and stupidity so uh, i'm sure it's completely full even today of these things so uh, so when i'm saying all of spirituality i mean all of it i don't mean all except here <laughs> so uh, so how to make sure and of course we would hope all of us would hope that there should be no burnt rope left you know it'd be so much easier if this me just completely went away then be so much easier and that's what i saw isn't it there is no me and for a while we must like guru ji says cocoon ourselves in that insight and remain just truly in that without any concern of rope or rope any of that can be kept aside but when you start to see and this happens to everyone that something here is getting attached to me having insight me being spiritually awakened me getting to enlightenment or even me loving god anything that has to which glorifies me that one although non existent must be brought in be love and servitude of god because if that one is allowed to run rampant then it ends up contaminating the most beautiful awakening the most beautiful insight so we cannot wish away and i have not heard any report of any sage unless it is a purely glorified sort of facebook post or something like that but if you read the books from history and um the lives of sages 
every sage has said that the love for God and the servitude to God is at least as important as the insight that they have had about their oneness with God. You will struggle to find a sage um, who has said, I am now one with God, so he should serve me, I should not serve him. That is a maybe a rare thing. But like Guruji says, all of us must always keep our head bowed down. All sages, um, some of the children in Sangha have been reading Sri Ramakrishna and his life embodies so beautifully uh, love and servitude to God. Because if we catch a, hold, catch a hold of pride, then that pride will reinvent a new me, which is now a spiritual persona. And that feels like uh, uh, it's fine to have that because it's full of insight, you know. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's still blocking God's love. It's still blocking God's light. You're living still as if you are a me, an individual who is now a claimant to some authority because of God's grace of an awakening. So this servitude, this love is very, very important. And servitude is a broad term I'm using to signify a deep faith in God, a deep humility about ourselves, a great obedience to being available and following God's will at all costs. And also a prayerful attitude, a prayerful way of being. And all of these, you don't have to get intimidated when you hear them. All of them are the legs of one table. You pull at one leg. So if you're prayerful, you are going to be humble. You are going to be obedient you are going to be faithful. So it's all interconnected. But this servitude is very important. And we've discussed this many times that most world religions put following God's will, let thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, is central to all religion, the devotion of Hanuman is central to Indian Hindu spirituality. And there is no other icon that we that is as prevalent in India today than Hanumanji is. So what does that signify? It is not the warrior mode of Hanuman is just when he was called by the Lord to get into that mode. So we must not mistake what truly Hanuman stands for. He stands for an utter devotion and servitude to his master Lord Ram.
So this devotion, this servitude is central. Guru Nanak Ji has said to follow his will is the only way to let go of the veil of ignorance. To be a Muslim only means the one who follows God's will. The word itself translates into that. So we've heard this guidance from everywhere. So servitude is really important and love. Now love is very beautiful because it's God's love. Nobody can really say, I created love for God. I created love for God. And yet, you can actively love God. It's not a solvable puzzle. It's like, again, intuitive. <laughs> it's really like, does God give us that love? Or can I actively love as well? Both and neither and whatever option. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that it's completely within our power to love God. And it doesn't have to be the word God, although it's a very beautiful word, but just love for the being whose presence is here. And intuitively we can recognize that that being is the only being there is. So some who resist uh, loving God say, can I not love nature, can I not love some other aspect, but all of that comes from the only intelligence, the only being there is. And that being in its beauty, in its grace has also given itself the name and the presence I am. And that presence <coughs> is here. It is the same one, the same timeless one. The one in which the universe takes birth and all this play of time and space and generations and generations seem to play out in this dream. This I am is the projector, the screen, the enjoyer of this, of this play. And the beauty of loving God is that you can't help that love from being reflected. As hard as you may try, you say, I'm going to only love God. See, all these people are all Maya, they don't exist, they're, my, they're dream characters, let them go away. <laughs> but you can't help it. If you love God, it is bound to reflect even in this play of Maya. Now the beauty of love is that being in love anchors you, it anchors you. You don't fall for the temptations and fears of the mind because you're so deeply in love.
so traditionally in india we call servitude mixed with love as bhakti and bhakti is not just love because you can love someone but you don't want to serve them you see you may love your partner a lot but you don't want to serve them you don't want to have a partner dictated life you see so <laughs> you may be and i'm trying to encourage all of you to become happy to have a god dictated one but you don't want to necessarily although you may feel a lot of love for someone you don't want to let them rule over your life and your world so bhakti is that and in the same way you may be very obedient at work and follow everything your manager tells you to do but you don't necessarily love them you don't uh, uh, necessarily have to love them so bhakti is a combination of that servitude and love and i only put them in that separate baskets for explanation so that we don't neglect either side of it so as um, bhagwan said that the life of a true gyani is like a bird one wing being gyana and the other wing being bhakti is it so i'm not trying to make three wings now out of that i'm just defining bhakti a little more especially for those in the west so before self realization or insight or awakening love and servitude after insight or awakening and then it's there's no like there's no end to that insight it's it only seems as if the insight came to us it was actually always there but we were never empty we were always caught up in the little me so when we drop the me when we let go of our self will and self concern in love and servitude then we make that's why i'm saying before because in love and servitude we make the fertile ground for the darshan of the holy presence and the insight of the absolute but it is not something that you can say oh all that was my sadhana now it is done we now and just you know like the mahaguru of the world because <laughs> i have realized the absolute reality yeah? the mind tempts you to do that it tempts you to do that it says that you are so special now so at this time where the baby is being delivered it's really important to continue to love and continue to to have the inner intention of being only in service to god and as you carry the intention of following god's will you will see that he is always available he is always here so this i feel to say now that this is what is coming through as the way of the heart
Look at the questions. Amba and Mahesh are together, so let's go to them. My father. Hello, my loves. Good, good, good. Um, I just wanted to mention something that. Uh, has been seen and has been happening. Um, and um, I noticed from playing these big epic computer games that no matter how much I accomplish within them, uh, they don't affect what we would call the real world. And from that, I've also noticed that no matter uh, what happens in the real world, it doesn't change who I am, what I am. Um, yeah. And... I keep having moments of just um, losing interest in what I'm doing. And not really seeing a point. What are you risking? I don't know. <laughs> let me share a little. Let me share a little bit more on that. So, <laughs> uh, we often speak about faith and how faith is important. No? And um, these days, I've been saying so much that it's about me for God rather than God for me. And faith is the only way to live in that way, where the equation is corrected. Okay. The God for me equation means that God must make himself available to make me happy, to make me peaceful, to make me enlightened, to make me whatever goal we may have. Because I am somehow entitled to that, I have the right to that. But faith tells us that Unless we are died to ourselves, completely empty of ourselves, then we cannot, like I said, everything is possible, but it's very rare for us to live in God's light and God's presence. Now, to become empty for God, means that we must risk everything for him. So there is no faith without risk. So what is it that we are risking? What are we living purely in faith with? How are we, or have we computed every aspect of our life and God is just an aspect that we feel like is a support system?
Are you risking your life for God? Not in a daredevil way. Maybe, maybe even more actually. It feels like more and more uh, life is less important than the just sitting in the self. Just um, I don't know if I'm risk. I don't know if I'm risking something. I don't. I what would you not give up? Let's put it that way. If God said, don't talk to Amba after this, <laughs> that may be okay actually for you. And yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, uh, what, what would you not do for God? I, I don't know if there is anything. You do everything for God. I don't I don't know anything that's more important. Yeah. What if you God said that you can live in my presence, but in some strange way you will never experience any joy or peace ever again? Yes. Yeah, I don't. I don't feel like I have any control really over what happens. So, like, yeah, not. If, but suppose you did. Mm. <laughs> suppose you did. It's it's all right. We don't really have control. You're right. But suppose you did, and God was sitting at the opposite end of a negotiation table with you, and you say, "God, you are the most important thing for me now." So God says, "It's it's just." Um, uh, an analogy, a metaphor that we're using. So then God said, okay, I be with you. You love me so much, I will be with you. But you will never experience joy or peace again. It's a question Maybe. like this, I'm just provoking. I'm, of course, yeah, I'm provoking yeah, yeah. Them. And they're not simple questions, and I'm so happy you're not just being purely rah rah and saying yes, 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 whatever, yes, yes. You know, so I'm very happy that you're hearing them and you're just meeting them because it's not they, these are not easy questions, and um, uh, we must not fool around with them. So I'm happy that you're truly meeting them because. Questions like this help us clarify whether it is truly me for God or God for me. It is not meant to create any unworthiness or guilt. It is just meant to expose any blind spots in our faith. So I have been grappling with the Abraham story for now 3-4 months or maybe longer. So I don't want to repeat it here. but. Uh, uh, I don't know if you are aware of it, you can look it up, it's a beautiful contemplation on faith. So, uh, what, what, I, what I feel to say is that uh, there, there is a peace to uh, God that there is a peace there is a peace to God that is, uh, uh, it's beyond, it's untouched by uh, the experiences in the world. And Okay, but suppose it wasn't there. Suppose there was no peace, no, none of the goodies, none of, one of the things I'm trying to do with the Sangha is really ask them whether they want God or do they just want his goodies? Do we want God without the perks? 
if god somehow some strange fiction lost all his power but he was still god would you still want him yeah at the cost of all peace joy any happiness can i say something yeah. Yeah. when you're speaking what's going here is like you ask these questions you know and we answer and like they're very genuine and i know they're very genuine and i would answer the same and probably everyone in the sangha is like i'll give up everything you know because <laughs> we feel like that well what i've seen is in myself is that yeah i would answer like that but then maybe some time it appears that i see what well, something is holding on to something you know and it's like okay i haven't actually given up this and really we don't know how to answer that question because you don't know until you see it in yourself so like somehow it's like that and you don't see it. and then maybe in that moment only in the moment when you see that there's being grasping or something then maybe you can answer that question and probably it will be the same answer like but then and then is only then when you can give up so we don't really know how to answer it like yeah. you know. yeah. <laughs> we don't know it's true that we uh, don't know till we meet it in this way and it reveals itself mm-hmm. and yet there's a certain beauty of truly with our heart asking this question because god you know has a way of revealing to us whatever we are deeply contemplating you know is uh, it comes haven't you noticed that uh, if you've been contemplating a certain thing then like something reveals itself in super quick time so there's great potency in just asking ourselves that uh, is my uh spirituality an armchair uh comfortable spirituality is it or is there a fiery risky something that uh, is there that can you know really energize it because otherwise we can get uh, very involved in oh this this then okay now this is what happened with me and then this is what happened with me and then now this is what's happening with me and You see, so we lose really that this entire play is about God. It's really about God. We're not even in the timeline of God's this dream that we call this universe. We're not even like bit characters. We call them extras in India. No? What are we? Yes. So suppose you watch the whole movie, and you miss the fact that it was about a central protagonist, who was God and not the me. Then that will be a wasted ticket, isn't it? So is God's light apparent to you? Is His yeah. presence with you now? Yes. do you feel like life would be life or as i've been calling it a zombie life without this discovery of god's presence and god's light here i just feel like sorry if it grosses anyone out but i just feel like the slab of meat living uh, this life is actually be as good as bed if it is without god Yeah, and while you're contemplating this, I have some memory of the boy, the man that was here before I found the presence of this being in my heart. 
And that is not a life that I would wish on anyone. Oppressed by desire, oppressed by wanting to win, to become somebody. I was really stupid, I have to say. I still am, but I was <laughs> exceptionally stupid when I was younger. And it was, you know, like a very quiet arrogance. Nobody would look at me or nobody would say, oh, what arrogant, hopefully, <laughs> they would say, what arrogant uh, uh, boy or man. Uh, but I had this crazy life in my head. Like when we first landed in Bangalore, my father had got a job here and we landed here. And we landed at Bangalore airport, the plane door opened, I looked at the city and said, one day I'm going to be a king of this city. You know, this kind of nonsense is to go on. <laughs> this is the most absurd, stupid, idiotic nonsense. And it was just so, and I was actually believing all of this you see, as a 20 something, 21 year old or 22 year old, just buying into all these notions of ambition and desire and achievement and all of these things. And I won't wish that on anyone. Missing uh, what is true, what is really alive in our life, all this mental garbage. So that one was as good dead as so called alive, I have to say. I don't call that life at all now. And there's just grace that rescued this one from that zombie life. So, Make that central, don't make it about you anymore, just make that God's presence is here. Okay. At best, what can we be? How can we be of service? He will tell us, he will tell us. You see, are we really listening or are we determining in our head how my life should be now that God is here? How should be? <laughs> All of these things we may still be computing somewhere where we don't need to. We how to follow God's will? Beautiful question, isn't it? Like we've spoken so much about servitude and faith and humility, but how to follow His will? It's actually very simple. When we are empty and living in the presence, most of the so-called decision making that we had to do is not needed anymore. It just, we find that the presence moves. You see? Like, if you were to talk to that boy that I just mentioned, and uh, he was told that you have to talk to hundreds of people, sharing some, uh, any topic, you see, for two, three hours, um, three times a week, or something like that, he would just, like, prepare and make notes and figure things out and do all of that, you see? But living in God's light, I don't have to decide how it is going to flow. It just, the presence uses this mouth, it speaks, it is moving these hands. There is no idea here about what is going to be said next or what is going to come up next. But there's a deep faith, there's deep trust in that. So that is the simplest way of following God's will, when we are just empty. The second is that we receive some prompts, but we don't know how that came to us. You see, like very often this has happened with you all when, um, when it is about coming to satsang or not. 
many times you have decided no no today i'm too busy i have this other stuff and something just you know prompt you from within saying come so it nudges you like that where you don't even know how it happened but you just feel like you knew you had to be here or you had knew you had to go there so that is intuitive knowledge of god's will and then as we get used to living empty then all of us will also hear his voice is it it may not be a voice voice but you may hear it in various different ways and when we start to hear his voice um the projects of what he wants you to do he makes things very simple it's very clear but they may not always be easy is it they may not always be easy in terms of our understanding of what easy would be so to make ourselves available in that way is very important is very beautiful like um, this particular project has been brewing here uh, by god's grace that uh, actually first i started seeing it when um, I was walking back one day from um, the hospital. My father was in the intensive care unit, the ICU, and uh, we lost. Uh, he left his body a few days after that. But as uh, I was walking down from the hospital, most of you know Manipal Hospital next door. So as I was walking down, I was just getting these images, you know, like um, images of. walking on the streets and just talking about god and talking to people and just uh, asking them if they met god and it just uh, started getting this kind of sense and uh, it felt very at home actually yeah. because the expression here usually has been very like city boy and comfortable ac environment and you know this kind of thing but when so something has been prompting me from inside and then as this comes as all of us know when the prompting starts to come then many things come in the world also just reinforcing that yeah? so you hear somebody you uh, get guided in that way so so we can be nudged in this uh, particular way and uh, i i feel like uh, we can never be deterministic about these things but usually god's ways to nudge 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 very patiently for a long time till eventually if we don't move then it comes to push <laughs> but before suffering and before pushing i feel like there've always been plenty of nudges uh, even here when i look back at my life i can definitely confirm that there were many many nudges that god sends our way so the important sorry i'm just ra- rambling on about this but because i feel like it's it's important to just clarify the whole uh, thing or whatever uh, insights that i have come to so how do we determine whether it is not just our mind tricking us is it that's a very important question how do we determine that really this is god's will and how do i know that it's not just the mind which is tricking us so um, and i've tackled this question over the last decade or so in various ways but i feel like um, i used to say and maybe i'll start from that direction that if who you truly are is apparent to you and you're receiving guidance then you can trust that guidance to be coming from god because who you are is apparent to you when you're being intuitive it is not apparent otherwise so if you're not uh, deluded in that moment identified in that moment and it is clear that you are this pure awareness and in that intuitive insight which is usually accompanied by just sheer silence and yet it doesn't have to be that way because the sharing of satsang happens like that you see so words can come Okay, so, uh, so that 
I feel is pretty much foolproof because uh, I don't feel like we have the capacity to juggle our intuition and our mind together. You see? I feel like we are too limited to be able to do that. So if you're just truly with integrity, checking whether this is true that I'm not taking myself to be the false one and my reality is completely apparent to me and I'm receiving some guidance or some words are coming, then that can be trusted uh, pretty much. Now, many have reported to me saying, but we are not there. We can't, we don't have self-recognition. We, do, we can't use that. And I want to f- be guided by God so I can come to self-recognition. You are saying that you must recognize yourself and treat that guidance as God. So that's too confusing for us. So then I say, okay, so is your being palpable? Is the sense of presence palpable? So, um, and if that is palpable, then then also that guidance can be trusted. Some have said, no, no, but even that is too difficult. So I said, okay, can you find some a presence of some unconditional love in your heart? Is there some love in your heart, some unconditional love in your heart? And if you're being guided, and that love is present, you can trust that. So, this is... um, I've also been giving some good news saying that if your intention is truly in your heart to follow God's will, even if you're being tricked by the mind, God will make grace out of it. There's no... nothing you have to worry like that, that I got tricked. So, what, what really matters is what is our inner attitude, what is our atmosphere within me. And if it is of servitude to God, then there is no such thing as a mistake. So we don't have to worry uh, so much about that. But having said that, uh, you can use these pointers to really gauge. So if God is most important, as we say, then are we living moment to moment in God's will? That is the question that we have to really contemplate and ask ourselves. And everything else, um, I've been calling her armchair spirituality. That yes, yes, his presence is there, I'm all fine, but I'm going to still live on my own terms and you know decide I don't want to go too far with this stuff. And you know, what if God asks for something uncomfortable? Mm-hmm. Now you're seeing all the connections, isn't it? So God's presence is here. Then it is not possible really to say that we are living in God's presence and not be available in servitude to that presence. Then we're not. Then we're just using it as a safety net or a comfort mechanism. So are we living in our own ideas or terms of what our life should be or we really made our life available for God to use? So this is the faith I'm talking about. This is the risk. Why is it risky? Because you don't know how he's going to guide you next. Yeah, there is um, there is a fear of What could it be that I am guided to do? And yeah. uh, okay, so that is when you receive like specific uh, guidance. What about living empty with no not, nothing in your head, waiting for him to move you? Yeah, it's, it's when the mind comes in with that fear. It says, but what if? And what about um, if it's if the if that mind uh, is not commenting like that, then 
there's uh so can we do an experiment mm. okay since amba is here i don't know how long she is here for but uh, if she is going to be here another day and i know she is one of the most honest uh, people i've ever met so <laughs> she she can keep a watch on you and you have to just be empty for god and allow only god to move you can we risk one day to start with initially even this can feel like a risk just to live empty can feel like a risk because will he make me quit my job will he say leave your family will he will he say leave your city and move to bangladesh or something we don't really know how like not even we, now we are not even waiting for saying we are just finding ourselves booking ticket you know one way ticket to bangladesh to dhaka or something like that you can feel like a risk no? you see and what is denial denial is just to pretend it never happened like this it didn't just like no? He didn't tell me. No, there was no <laughs> movement. <laughs> the mind will come in and attack you with all its might as you start to get used to living like that. You see, you just say, no, nothing happened. You're just making things up now. You see, and God is again moving through you, going to the booking site. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> nothing happening. <laughs> then we start reading the reach, meeting the boundaries of our faith. No, that's very important because nobody. even the greatest sage and if i can say this on behalf of bhagwan even bhagwan i would not say that i have 100% faith okay everybody must find a way to meet the boundaries of their faith because the minute you say no no i do anything i do anything for god you see we have not really contemplated this um, question i really contemplated this is because um, i read kirkagard again a few months back and he is very authoritative when he says no risk no faith and first when i read it i was like really and then as i've been really contemplating it's true it's completely true um um something that i found so it's just one thing coming up strongly to say which is that so then we move away from like a sort of tepid timid sort of life to a moment to moment fiery life full of god and risk and you know just like so i'm excited about just imagining that for you i'm getting excited <laughs> mm-hmm. now you can see you were saying something this uh when i'm present there's no need for hope or trust um because they're about a future you know and um what's the difference between hope and faith It's like hope is desiring a certain outcome. Faith is trusting whatever outcome unfolds. Yes, but is then faith just a strong belief? And if faith was just a strong belief, then how does that compute with "Don't believe your thoughts and be empty of your mind"? is there a faith which is therefore beyond belief feeling moved
like this it uh, maybe i make it little simpler so what is the difference between having faith that god is here versus just having a belief that god is here one atheist no um, he is the poster boy for all atheists in the world his name is richard dawkins so he said um, i hope i'm not getting the name wrong and uh, saying that about somebody else so he said that faith is just an irrational belief how would we what would you say when you say it it seems to me like no i yeah it's not how i would or, or traditionally uh, classify faith but when when you say it uh faith that god is here is to me knowing yes so to trust our intuitive insight more than the rationalizations of the mind is faith for me is it because um, yes it doesn't have to be rational and that way the atheist may be right but the fact is that it's not irrational because there's a deeper knowledge which guides faith and based on faith we say things like the world is ephemeral but god is reality the world comes and goes but god always remains it's based on faith which means that is it just blind faith in the sense of blind intellectual concepts that we learned from books or teachers no it is from insight we can't explain them like how do you know he is always here he is beyond time how do you know is it so somebody may ask me that no? you keep saying this all this stuff ananta but how do you know were you there to see that he was there 2000 years ago to see that he was there 5000 years ago so yes you have to say that intellectually and logically i don't know but in my heart in my faith i do know but it is not just a rational belief that i have picked up it is something that is so clear in my heart that it is true so this is the beauty of faith that it may not be rational to the world but it is a deep knowing a heart knowing intuitive knowing but one of the expression or movement of this faith i have noticed is that it always is pushing against your boundaries so if you are finding that that is not happening then just uh, contemplate whether you are really devoting every moment moment by moment in service to god thank you for the questions and giving me the opportunity to share all this has been brewing in my heart and thank you for allowing that to happen so who is visiting who i am not aggressively speak Moment. We live very close to each other, so we we oh, see yes. often. So we just decided to be in Satsang I together. See. He's in my house. Now. Yeah. <laughs> But you always live close to each other, is it? Yeah. No, I see. Yeah, yeah. we see each other a lot. Yeah. <laughs> very, very, very. Love you, love you. Thank you.
Do I need to say anything else? Maybe I just hear everyone, no? Okay, that's good. Ah, today all of you were going to share, isn't it? Ah, I forgot. This is a... <laughs> God didn't prompt me at the start of Satsang, so this it just came like that. Okay, but let's hear the questions quickly and then we can see if we have time. <clears throat> let's go to Chanda. Pranam, Father. Namaste, Namaste. Are you at the hospital? It's a report. No, we will be a home, Father. Thank you. He's put on medicine for two weeks. And if he's, yeah. we can wait for two weeks before doing any testing by our grace. I think she's, she's okay. I'm so, so grateful to you, Father. She has mild pneumonia yes. is what he's saying. Yeah, she keeps me posted uh, with her beautiful voice messages, which I love to hear. Tell her that if she's not in satsang. So I'm very happy that uh, she seems to be in very good spirits and living so strongly in God's faith. I'm very happy. She, her messages are mostly about how people are concerned and uh, more worried than her. So, so I can understand that from a from a child's perspective, it's not easy to see a parent go through these things. So, all my love, blessings, hugs, everything, everything is with you, my child. Thank you, Father. Father, may I make a report? Yes, yes, my child. <clears throat> so I was praying last night, Father, and uh, it, it came here. Uh, I'm that I, God, and as God, everything was a projection from here. And uh, moment to moment, you don't step in the same river twice, that line of yours had come to me and it was seen clearly that everything from here is a projection. Moment to moment, God being God, each moment is different. Each moment could be anything. Yes. Exactly. Of the phenomenon, Everything is a projection, moment to moment. Then I ask the question, then how about this person called Chanda? And there is no such person. Very good, very good. Very good. There is no person like that, exactly. Very beautiful and uh, the only precautionary advice is that uh, don't give this to your mind at all. Stay with this in your heart and let it deepen and deepen so deeply that you build a permanent house in your heart. Because if you give this to your mind, then it will make a position out of there being no Chanda. Or, but, you know, but then that is Chanda that is going to be the new avatar of Chanda proclaiming there is no Chanda. So, we don't want that to happen. Stay like these insights are coming from your heart. You stay at their source. Positionlessly, headlessly. Yes, sir. Everything, everything is from your heart, everything is taken care of there, everything becomes alive from there, comes into the screen of consciousness from there. That is the very source of this universe and every universe. So, 
you hold on to it with all your might. Let it be so, Father, by your grace. Yes. Full, full blessings, full blessings. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's go to Keisha. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. Hi, Father. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Can you? Can I hear me? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I was asking if you can hear my response to you when you said hi, Father. Did you hear what I said? Yes. Um. When you were talking about God using you as a tool or being a servant to God, that um, that God's always pushing the boundary and that it doesn't always feel good or comfortable. And um, I really felt that recently, that it's not how I perceived it would be. And it's not, and it wasn't peaceful and it wasn't joyous, but the only choice I had was to choose God. And in that choice and in that choosing, despite the discomfort and it being nothing like how I wanted it to be that was following that was the best way that i could follow was to say that this is coming this is the most painful experience of my life but i still choose god i still choose god and sometimes you don't know if you're going to choose god in those moments until it comes to life you don't know, you know, the stories of Abraham and you don't know until it happens. And sometimes it's surprising, you know, you're like, I didn't know I would choose God in this most painful moment. And um, I'm very grateful. There's definitely uh, a sort of depth of maturity and not that it wasn't there before, but uh, even more deepening uh, in your report to hear. Thank you, Father. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's so much to say, but also not really so much to say. But, um, nothing is how I perceived it would be. Yes, but, it um, really is, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank God, though. I can't believe it. Because if it had been everything I wanted it to be, I know that I would fall asleep. <laughs> God's grace. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Very welcome. <laughs> okay, Hello, Father. I um, 
Uh, I encountered this. Uh, <laughs> so in that moment, just pause here. This is very good. So in that moment where you're collecting yourself or whatever, then where where would you go to to get them out to speak? The first uh, answer that comes is nowhere. No, that came where? Where did that answer come? I went to a memory when I started to speak. Uh -huh. when it. i started when i started to speak to you mm -hmm. i went to a memory okay so start again let's pause let's pretend as if you're starting again now <laughs> hi father hello <laughs> <laughs> Just be relaxed, don't worry, you don't have to. <laughs> I am, I am yeah, like, like, worried. I, I, <laughs> uh, See again, just relax. The first rule of that song is relax. First, relax. Because yeah. otherwise it's all going to go yeah. in the wrong place. Okay. So, unless you relax, you cannot be open and empty. Unless you relax, we can't really have a communion. We may have communication. But uh, if you're going to be like like that, then it's not going to be anything fruitful. Yes. Um, There is an energetic sensation of losing myself in you.
Just make sure that you don't let the mind interfere. Yeah, otherwise, it'll start giving you positions and reports about what is happening and all of that. Stay happy. Uh, there is a subtle form of resistance that comes, and it came during this satsang, which is like sleep like. And I have to expose that or leave it at your feet. Cool. That's why we have recording. <laughs> yeah. I enjoy you going to sleep because at least in sleep you cannot trouble yourself. <laughs> deep sleep state, nobody can And children look like angels when they're sleeping. They're just, only after they wake up, they don't look so angelic anymore. <laughs> <sighs> now where are you going? <laughs> stay, stay. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid of going to sleep because... I, uh... But it happened naturally, you know, in satsang, you should just put on satsang and go to sleep. <laughs> it does. Many people do that. They, say they just hear my voice for two minutes and it's so boring, they just go to sleep. <laughs> I don't know why the default microphone changed. It also happens when I contemplate or when I meditate. Okay, so when I meditate. It's also blue. Is that the season? Oh, that one is not. So I can't speak now, I can only speak like this, so... Okay. Oh. Stay, 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 but you will find me, don't go with any other... Thank you. Let's go to Samia and Jason. Let's go to Samia first. Probably not hear me, and I can't hear. You can hear me, right? Can you hear me, brother? Yes. This is better. Not very long, but it's all right. It's all right. Um, now I cannot hear you, but okay. I mean, I can hear you, but not so well. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm good for the just um. <coughs> burning or whatever is happening recently yeah burning it's just so much here like yeah as i told you like immense <laughs> i don't know love or something so it... <laughs> burning in the love is the best report i've got all year <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I feel, I feel all good. 
I mean, yeah, just it's missing, and I feel like it it started to get fruit. Like after I I sent a message to you, like this light, this presence again, just becomes so 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 palpable, and yeah, just thank God for this. Um, yeah, and. Uh, Yes, yeah, still, I mean, I don't want to even report this right now. Just, just fully give it to you and just stay in this presence and in this attraction and love and just merge in this. And uh, yes, Absolutely. if this is a burning, just. Thank, thank you for this. I mean, if this is a burning, I, I don't know what it is, but yeah, in a way, just thank you. And I love you so much. <laughs> thank you for your being father. Let's go to Jason. Namaste, Natati. Just one moment, please. Can you see that? Zoom or boost. Can you hear me? Yes, my dear. We're just trying to make uh, my audio a little better, but it's on full. He's good. Well, yeah, I want to say um, the satsang, I, I got kind of irritated. It's the first time I got irritated in your satsang. Well, maybe not the first time, but like this. Because <laughs> um, when, you, when you gave the example of God asking if, or God saying, I, I will be with you, but you won't have peace or love. Yeah. Oh, joy, I felt, no, that's not possible because God is, yeah. is peace, is joy, and I, I wouldn't choose we, that. No, no. How can I choose? <laughs> it's no, it's, it's no so joy. Is that for God? I don't know if my audio yeah. is getting through, but does God have the prerogative to determine um, what he is like? Or humans should determine what God should be like? I don't know how can God be other than God. I don't know. Maybe. And yeah, God is God. Uh, and yeah, I felt uh, I got kind of irritated and felt like it also getting in into some like tight mode or moralistic because I, I tend to do that in the way you're speaking it. Like always speaking of God and you and God and you and serving God and you, but um, yeah, it's sometimes you were there in the beginning, beginning of Satan. So you there yeah. in the beginning about in. Well, actually, uh, I'm very happy to hear you. My uh, my intention somewhere is to irritate and to provoke a little bit to wake us out of something. So. I'm happy that uh, some meditation is there. Yeah, yeah. I'm also open to to feel that maybe where there are some the boundaries of my faith, as you said. Yeah, but on the other hand, I I don't feel I should get moralistic or something about anything like this. It would be only the mind again. Like you should or you have no, to. Or I mean, this moralistic yeah. thing is a beautiful conversation and. Uh, Next time when we have a better mic, just remind me, I want to talk more about this. But morality is a human replacement for a human convenience that allows us not to follow God's will moment to moment. Okay? Because we, we uh, sort of extrapolate, we project, okay, God would have wanted it to be like this. 
so we've codified a set of things and said okay that this is called ethics or morality but the thing with morality is that nobody's ever been able to agree on that people are still arguing about what is ethics and what is justice because in humanity we have lost the ability to follow god's will or not lost the ability but given up the intention to follow god's will moment to moment so we just made a set of codified principles saying that this is what god would have wanted now so this is this is the right way to live so then we don't have to turn to god because we all already know the right way to live because we have our morals that we can live by but if but if god is already there with you and he can guide you moment to moment and live your life moment to moment then why do you need a uh, morality but i need to spend more time on this we will to have a short conversation on this one because many will misunderstand what i'm saying so i want to if if i talk about this one day i'll take a good one hour explain slowly so that people don't get the wrong idea and it doesn't become advaita excuses for bad behavior hey so yes the audio is not so good uh, anyway. but uh, thank you for taking my invitation for the provocation irritation it's very good i'm happy to see you like it i feel like it will bring some fuel to the contemplation yeah. i i even felt like uh, leaving the satsang one moment and but i felt no it's not maybe, i don't want to do this also like have yeah i better bring it up yeah this is the perfect uh, perfect situation for the master where the disciple is getting provoked irritated but they can't leave that's the best thank you right since all of technology has given up on us it's going to be thank you all so much for being in satsang today so guru shri muji baba ki jai guru kripa Hi, Alta. You want to come up? At my mum. Yes, father. Hello. Hello. Hello, father. Hello, my dear. Good to see you. It's been a long time. Yes. I'm so happy. Are you happy? Congratulations yes. on your son's wedding. Yes. It was so beautiful. <laughs> It is so good. Yes, Father, I wanted to speak, but uh, you wanted to close the the satsang. So, am I audible to you? You are audible to me. Oh, so see, let's let's have a conversation. So yeah, on the same note of being, um, let's say, triggered. uh you're doing a good yeah. job <laughs> those past weeks <laughs> <laughs> and uh i want to thank you for this did you get did you get a sense of what i was saying because if you reread your message to me you will get a sense of what i was saying totally you know i'm very aware that of this uh look uh, warm warm we would say that look warmness and um yeah it was a a beautiful opportunity to check in again and and to re reconnect and um the fire has been uh, reignited and at some point when you were talking to mahesh i think and saying you know why not be empty and and just leave let god you know move you moment to moment i just wanted to just unmute 
you know, and, and not be on the waiting list because the fire is so strong. And and just to let you know, Father, if there is an opportunity to come, I would just take the first plane, you know, and uh, I've applied to Sahaja. I'm checking the mailbox every day. And, you know, mm -hmm. I know that the personal life is, uh, is uh, running super well, as you know. And it's the best opportunity to 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 fall asleep. I don't want that. I don't know how how many la lifetimes I've lived in this state and condition, but this life, Father, is for truth. And it's not an emotional. Now you're talking. Hmm? Now you're talking. This is I'm the talking. Atma I want to. Talk. I'm talking. Very good. Very and I want to good. By the name you gave me, Father. Very good. I don't want to be like a, you know, a famous singer. I, I don't give a shit. I'm sorry, but I just want to be, I just want to be one with God, no matter what, no matter what. I'm here. I'm here for truth. That makes me very happy. I'm very, very happy. Very, very, very. Love you, love you, Lord. Thank you so much. <laughs> you see how in this holy fire and in your surrender to the light within, you see beautiful grace, beautiful grace. Mm-hmm.